got this, okay? Let's do this. Love That's you. you. Here we go. In the UK, some three million major operations are carried out every year. Just take some nice big deep breaths. I'll take good care of you. But some patients' procedures are so complex, only the best surgeons can perform them. We're okay to go. Okay, Koki. You do have to have resilience. We have death on our doorstep all the time. Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge is world renowned for its pioneering techniques to treat conditions that few others dare to take on. Are you feeling brave? We often deal with people at the extreme end of life. So during an operation, you're almost in the heat of battle. But pushing the boundaries of modern medicine comes with great risk. No margin for error here. You have to accept that things will go wrong. Experience is learning from your mistakes. It's starting to split along where the stitches are going in. Every decision you make has direct consequences on someone's life. She's not responding. The surgeons bear the ultimate responsibility. Oh, no. A lot of bleeding here. This is not working. What a bugger! This is what really happens behind the closed doors of their operating theatres. It all looks good. Perfect. Mission accomplished. There we go. Brilliant. The patient is trusting you in a very difficult situation, and you just need to make sure that you deliver your part of that bargain. Adam Brooks Hospital is one of the country's leading centers for treating neurological disorders. Its surgeons take on some of the rarest and most high-risk cases. Neurosurgeon Ricky Trevedi is one of only a handful of consultants in the UK who operate on patients with neurofibromatosis, an incurable genetic disorder that causes tumors to grow from nerves around the body. One of my biggest passions is disorders of the nervous systems. I love doing this. It's an excitement about it uh, because it's an opportunity to do an operation none of my colleagues get to do. Just 25,000 people in the UK have this condition and Ricky only undertakes around six of these operations a year. As so few surgeons are specialists in this field, a crucial part of Ricky's job is training the next generation like Registrar Samia Mutlub. I think there are very few surgeons across the country who uh, have the same level of experience and breadth of experience as Ricky. Their next patient has two aggressive tumors. The first is sitting on nerves on the side of his neck. This one is more than five centimeters. But what's changed is that it's become so painful. Sometimes that can signify a change in the tumour's underlying biological nature, from something that we would expect to be benign to something a bit more sinister. The second tumour is smaller, around three centimetres in size, but it's in a far more dangerous position. What is unusual about this one is this is extending both inside and outside the spinal canal, and just here, starting to push onto the spinal cord. Left untreated, the tumor could put enough pressure on the spinal cord to cause permanent paralysis. You know, these operations can be challenging. You do have to have a certain level of resilience because we have death on our doorstep all the time. Ow. Their patient is 40-year-old Sam, who lives in Norwich with his wife Gemma and their three children. Sam's already had five operations to remove tumors caused by his neurofibromatosis. He's not cheating. As a young child, I wasn't aware of my illness at all. Yay! Well done. Well done. It wasn't until the age of maybe 17 that I started to notice I was getting a few lumps. Oh. And... Did you see that dive? now that I've been having these operations once every sort of three or four years. Neurofibromatosis is hereditary. Two of Sam's children also have the condition. 
although they've yet to experience any obvious physical symptoms. <laughs> oh. I do sometimes feel like he feels like he's guilty that two of our children have got it. But I keep saying to him, look, it's not going to stop them from doing what they want to do. One, two! Yeah. Well done, Charlie and Mum! Me and Sam definitely are holding it together. We've got to keep positive for the boys, definitely. But Sam's tumours are making day-to-day -day life increasingly difficult. Some days the pain kind of spreads up through my head. Four, add one. Five! Yeah! Well done, Charlie. It kind of feels like someone's clawing at the inside of my head. It really does get you down. Sam's high levels of pain means he needs to have an operation soon. But it will be the riskiest procedure he's ever had. Sam's tumours known as nerve sheath tumours, are growing from nerve roots where the nerve branches out from the spinal cord. They will be removed in a two-stage procedure. The first must be cut out carefully to avoid damaging the surrounding nerves, which could cause a loss of movement and sensation in the neck. Some will then be repositioned to give access to the second tumour, which is pressing on the spinal cord. A section of vertebrae needs to be removed so it can be cut away. But any damage to the cord could cause irreversible paralysis. Today, Sam's come to Adam Brooks with his mum. I am worried about the operation. I've been through quite a few before, but nothing quite as complicated as this one hope for a positive outcome. See you, Mum. Love you. Bye. You'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. For any operation, we will have a game plan. What potentially could go wrong? Where is the danger that I need to be alert to? In Theatre 20, a team of 13 specialist neurosurgical staff are preparing for Sam's operation, including two specialist anaesthetists, two neurophysiologists, and four nurses. Good. You're doing really well. Just drifting off to sleep. Sam's tumours are growing on his nerves, the network which carries electrical impulses between the brain and body. To monitor nerve activity during the operation, neurophysiologists need to attach 45 electrodes to his body. If they spot an unusual reading, they will know that the surgery is affecting Sam's nerve function. Redness that is slight. The greatest risks Sam has to accept from this surgery are complete paralysis. Arms, legs, wheelchair bound, feeding tube, breathing tube. You know, never going home really. Ricky is one of the country's most experienced surgeons at removing these tumours in such dangerous locations. But for Samir, this will be a brand new experience. This is the first time that I've been involved with nerve tumours within the neck and the spine. To reach the first tumour, Samir makes an eight centimetre incision in Sam's neck and cuts through a thin layer of skin and fat. Okay, let's have one of the big retractors. Every case I've done with Ricky, he'll find ways to, to make me improve. He's an excellent, excellent trainer. There's some eyes on the prize coming up. Very quickly, the six centimeter tumor is in their sights. Oh, it's flipping huge, huh? Good. All going well so far. Can we have a stitch, Maria? The tumour is growing directly from the nerve root beneath it. Ricky places a stitch through the tumour to gently pull it up and away from the nerve. You see, this is the, the nerve this is coming from. Yeah. So some of this is tumour, some of this is nerve. Can you see that? Yeah. So I think this is the, the medial border of it yeah. that you want to try and peel off. Samir must carefully peel away the nerves that are still connected to the tumour. If he cuts them, Sam could lose some movement in his shoulder and sensation in his head and neck. 
Now get your scissors in the other way around. Just use that to spread that tumour off that nerve and open the scissors. Samia, he's been working closely with me now for uh, the best part of six or seven months. Yep. Perfect. That's it. Good. Yes. He's progressed very, very well. He's turning out to be a very good surgeon. And further up. Hold it, spread, hold it, spread. That's it. OK, ready for hotline? Most nerve sheath tumours are benign, but there is a 5% chance they could be cancerous. That's come from the other side. To determine if Sam's tumours are cancerous, samples will be sent immediately to pathology for fast-track testing, known as a hotline. That can go. Hotline can go, please. That's pathology going, guys. Hello. I have a fair specimen. Ricky will get the results back during the operation, giving him an indication of the type of tumours he's removing. If it comes back as a benign thing, I'm a bit more relaxed. But if I'm told actually, no, there are some nasty features, you know, it's bad. Not just bad because it's a cancer, it's bad because if this looks like it's a cancer, I will have to be aggressive. If Ricky's dissection needs to be more radical, he risks damaging Sam's vertebral artery, cutting off the blood supply to his brain. Which means he may be left with a stroke. So there are pretty serious consequences. Rare operations that require the specialist skills of Attenbrook surgeons are not confined to neurosurgery. Often these procedures are so technically demanding, they require not one, but two expert consultants. Urological surgeons Jim Armitage and Tony Riddick have worked together at Addenbrooke's for nine years. Tony was kind of a mentor for me, supported me in my um, development as, as a consultant surgeon. And we've got a, a great relationship. We understand how each other works. It's second nature now, and I feel very safe uh, operating with Tony. I think Jim and I know each other so well that during an operation, we, we rarely have to, to say very much. It just seems to work. The most challenging operation requires such specific skills that Jim and Tony are the only surgeons at Adam Brooks that carry it out. We may need to divide that little accessory vein. A rare procedure to remove lymph nodes dangerously close to the body's biggest blood vessels. This is major surgery with where the stakes are very high. There is a risk of bleeding, there is a risk of mortality. Their patient is teenager Jamie, who lives in Bedford with his mum Eve, his dad Gary, and his sister Georgia. So, son, do you want to play you black or white? Black as always. Black as always. Eight months ago, when just 19, he discovered he had testicular cancer. Finding out that I had cancer, yeah, it was very difficult. My family, everyone's very supportive uh, and just trying to get me through it. Jamie had a testicle removed, but his ordeal didn't end there. Doctors then discovered that the cancer had spread to his lymph nodes, part of the body's immune system and crucial for fighting infection. And then we were checking it out. When I first heard, I pulled over on the side of the road that night and just had a cry. Yeah, it was just like, surely this can't get any worse than it is. Jamie has had multiple courses of chemotherapy, but one of his lymph nodes has swollen to four times its normal size. There is no way for doctors to know if it is still cancerous, so the only option now is major surgery to remove it. Let's check, mate. <laughs> That's the lumbar arch. Yeah, it it's behind. It's just another little Down lumber there. there it is, possibly. It? Yeah, there is one there, isn't there? Jamie's operation is rare, with less than 200 a year carried out in the UK. It will be even more difficult because the lymph node mass is attached to the vena cava, one of the body's major blood vessels. 
the main problem is going to be probably the lower extent of the tumour. It's always tricky, that lower bit there, isn't it? You know, we have occasionally had, had a bleed from that area. Jamie's potentially cancerous lymph node mass is four centimetres wide, located behind the organs in his abdomen. To access it, Jim and Tony will have to move his bowel without damaging it. The mass is attached to the body's largest vein, the vena cava, so it must be carefully removed. Any damage to this major blood vessel could cause a fatal bleed. There's the vena cava. Here's the lower extent of the mass. It's occupying a sort of a fairly large area of the cava. How stuck do you think it'll be, Jim? It's d difficult to tell, isn't it? The mass is inseparable from the, the cava on Jeez. the imaging, yeah. uh, but in reality, there's no way really of knowing until we're, we're operating. Yeah, that's going to be our main challenge, isn't it, really? Uh, keeping the cava intact. Mm -hmm. It can be so delicate and thin. Bleeding from the vena cava can be torrential. Even a very small hole in the vena cava can lead to very rapid blood loss. Some people refer to it as tiger territory. It certainly could be life-threatening. So, how are you feeling? Uh, OK. This whole experience has improved my resilience, and obviously, if I can get through this, I feel like I can get through anything. Morning. In Theatre 20, Jim briefs the surgical team for Jamie's five-hour operation. So, first patient, Jamie, 19-year-old young man, uh, for a post-chemotherapy retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Main concern is how adherent it might be to the vena cava. Uh, blood loss, uh, about 500 millilitres, we expect, but it could be more. I'm a father of three boys who are all teenagers, uh, and when I see patients such as Jamie uh, with uh, potentially a devastating diagnosis, I find that quite hard. It must be, you know, tremendously difficult for them and their families. Yeah. This is clearly a, a, a very major piece of surgery. I try not to worry about it. I'm hoping Jamie will be clear to start rebuilding his life. You want to try and go into these things with as positive mind as you can, because it will help you get through it. I just started thinking about a nice place and dream yourself away to that. Get this done, try and get everything back to normal. We'll wake you up when it's all done. We're at the start then. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. We're just starting, Jim. OK. To get access to Jamie's abdomen and the lymph node mass, Tony makes a 20 centimetre incision from just below the rib cage to pass the navel. OK, diathermy, please. Next, they cut through the abdominal wall, a five centimetre thick layer of connective tissue, muscle and fat. Yeah, that's good. The lymph node mass is sitting right at the back of the abdominal cavity. Should we get some retractors in, do you think? Yeah, and then we can start mobilising. Before we remove the mass, we've, we've, got to, we've got to get to it. So we have to mobilise the right colon and then small bowel. That includes the duodenum. We lift those off the main vessels. I'm just going to be a little yeah. bit careful just as we come through here. They start by mobilising the colon cutting through the connective tissue that supports it while moving it to make space within the abdominal cavity. Okay. Let's see where we are in terms of the... Where are we in terms of anatomy? Yeah, actually, it was good. Yeah. On the With the colon mobilised, Jim and Tony get their first glimpse of the lymph node mass. You can see the mass just through there, but mm -hmm. that's what we've got to get rid of. They can see that the four centimetre mass is not only stuck to the vena cava, but also to part of the small bowel. The first things that go through my mind are whether this mass will come out easily or will it be difficult or will it not come out at all? We can see the mass uh, is quite stuck to the, the duodenum and this is a result of the, the, the fibrosis, the scar tissue after chemotherapy. Uh, the bipolar scissors, please. They need to dissect the duodenum, the first part of the small bowel, 
away from the mass as delicately as possible. So just be a little bit careful taking this off. Yeah. If the duodenum perforates, uh, it, it's, it's very serious. The processes of digestion take place here with enzymes that are released from the pancreas and the liver. And if these toxic enzymes go into the peritoneal cavity, it can result in, in severe illness. To free the mass, Tony must cut through connective tissue millimetre by millimetre. Just very gently on your pull, Jim. As there. Jim gently pulls the duodenum away. Tiny bit of tension. Yeah, I think it's cold cutting there, really. This involves a, a, a little bit of tension on the, on the tissues. So if you could put a right angle just in there, Jim, and just show me that. Too much tension can result in, in tearing of the outer parts of the duodenum. Good. So we are very gentle. Just careful on your stretch there, Jim. Put on that duodenum. Yeah. Be a little bit careful. Just a little bit of freedom there. Even the smallest hair could lead to dangerous digestive chemicals spilling into Jamie's abdominal cavity. You're operating down a deep, dark hole, as we call it, so it's a delicate part of the surgery. It has to be done very carefully you know, in a very controlled fashion. That's better. The last bit of duodenal mobilization for us. Good. A little bit down there. Yeah, that's good, Tony. The duodenum is almost free from the mass. Really? If we could just come... When Jim notices a problem. Just a bit of a cirrhosal defect, isn't it? We do encounter a small tear in what's called the cirrhosa, so the outer part of the duodenum. Just there. Yeah. When pulling the mass away, the delicate duodenal tissue has torn. If it was left untreated, there's a chance that the, the duodenum would perforate. If you come out, Jim. And this would lead to major complications such as peritonitis, so a life-threatening complication. Automatic ligger, please. We have to resolve that problem. Just have a small swab there where this is. We have to make sure it's repaired as, as well as possible. By mid-morning, operations are underway in all of Addenbrooke's 37 theatres. In Theatre 22, Ricky and Samir are waiting to find out if the tumour in Sam's neck contains cancerous cells. We don't want to cut that just yet. If it does, the surgery to remove it will need to be much more extensive. We get frustrated sometimes, waiting around for what the pathologist is going to say. It may just be a few minutes, but it'll seem like it's a few hours. After 30 minutes, the results are ready. Benign, near fibroma. Initial findings show no evidence of cancer. Ricky and Samir don't need to perform a risky, more radical dissection, but they still need to remove as much tumor as possible. Now, are we going to be low enough? Or do we need to mobilize a bit more? As they continue. What the heck is this? The neurophysiologists begin picking up unexpected responses from the nerves that control movement. We're getting some activity from the uh, tongue, a little bit from the trapezes as well. The removal of the tumour appears to be affecting some of the nerves that control Sam's muscle movement. Trapezius, I can understand. Tongue is probably just pressure. We're at the back of the tumour, so the hypoglossal could be uh, nudged as well. The hypoglossal nerve controls movement of the tongue. If it's damaged, Sam could lose the ability to talk and swallow. It's probably being pulled or pushed by something. But we've been well behaved, we haven't cut anything. That's nerve? Is that nerve or tumour? Tumour. As Ricky and Samir continue to dissect around the tumour, the nerve responses get stronger. Are you pulling the spinal cord? No. Nope. Oh, it's proper big now, big amplitude. Hand, leg. We're like millions of miles away from there. If the responses don't stop, it could indicate Ricky and Samir are causing irreversible damage that could leave Sam paralyzed. 
very unhappy with you. Well, we're not doing anything naughty. It's still going. If they're seeing activity in a way in which I think is unexpected, that will cause me to pause and think, why is that? So I might need to modify how I'm taking this tumour out. I'm going to take some steam out of this to give us a bit more room. Ricky decides to cut away part of the tumour that could be putting pressure on the nerves and spinal cord. So we're just taking some of the bulk of this out just to give us a bit more room to manipulate it. Finally, as the pressure is eased, signals from Sam's nerves return to normal. Hey. Everything's OK. Ricky and Samir can now safely remove the rest of the tumour. Okie and dokie. This is brilliant. This is stage one over. We close that now. Ricky and Samir have managed to remove the first tumour without causing any nerve damage. Now they face the more challenging tumour that's growing within Sam's spinal canal. The spinal cord is very sensitive. It's not something to take lightly because forget cutting into it or just manipulating part of the spinal cord can result in permanent damage. Unroll, ready, steady, roll. The team repositions some so the surgeons can access the tumour through the back of the neck. Well done, everybody. First, through an incision, Ricky and Samir must drill away a section of vertebrae called the lamina to access the spinal canal. Then they need to cauterize the tiny blood vessels connected to the tumor without causing a dangerous bleed. Finally, as the tumor has penetrated the dura, the membrane surrounding the spinal cord, they have to open it to free the three centimeter tumor without damaging the cord which is sitting alongside. After cutting through the skin, fat and muscle at the back of Sam's neck, Ricky and Samir are ready to remove the lamina to access the tumor. Time for a microscope and drill. For this stage of the procedure, the operating field is so small that Ricky and Samir will have to use a microscope which magnifies by 10 times. Okay, let's go with the drill. A high-speed drill, rotating at 75,000 revolutions per minute, cuts through the bone. We'll try and get the hole from one side to preserve some stability with the C2. Okay, through there, take the rest of the two off. To avoid cutting straight through the spinal cord, Samir uses a bone scraper to remove the final layers of bone two millimetres at a time. So well, this is all tumour, isn't it? Yeah. Once the bone has been removed, Ricky and Samir get their first glimpse of the tumour. It's connected to multiple tiny blood vessels, each just two millimetres wide. They need to be cauterised and sealed to cut off the blood flow. Let's have a bit more flow seal. For any vessel that bleeds... OK, come on, flow seal down. Samir applies Flow Seal, a gel which aids the natural clotting process. This Flow Seal is amazing stuff, huh? Yeah. yeah. So there's space to get round here now. Get round it. Suddenly, one vessel starts to bleed uncontrollably. So we've got some bleeding now. To tackle the bleed, Ricky uses a product called Surgicel. Made from plant matter, it stimulates the body to produce enzymes which help the blood to clot. A few squares to me in, on the debakey. Yeah. Okay, out you come. But before it has a chance to work. Suction blocked or full. There's a problem with the suction machine. Suction full, let's swap it, please, quickly. 
switch to suction things if they're blocked or full? Because something is not working it's properly not here. It's not working. Is blocked it the machine there. or...? It's blocked because I can see it working here. It must be blocked your end bit. The machine appears to have become blocked with clotted blood. Right, well, we need to fix it, please, guys, because we've got some bleeding now. Pooling blood is obscuring the operating field, preventing them from stopping the bleed. We've got suction that's not working properly, and we're struggling to get proper hemostasis with these veins. There are things that can happen during an operation which you can't have anticipated, and you have to adapt to. Suction not working again. Suction's blocked, God's sake. Within minutes, the team brings in the backup suction unit. Quickly, quickly. Get the other big one on. But the vessel is still bleeding. Sam has now lost more than a litre of blood. They sense that I am uneased. They're all uneased. The room goes quiet. Everyone's running around a bit quicker than they normally do. And the whole dynamic of the whole case changes. Got a lot of hemorrhage here. What a bloody bugger! Faced with the ever-present threat of a serious bleed, the theatre teams at Addenbrooke's use 150 litres of blood every week. Much of that blood comes from one of Europe's largest blood banks, here in Bristol. Every night, more than 2,000 blood donations arrive on site from across the country. A team of 90 need to process all this blood in less than 27 hours. Phil Brown is one of its longest serving members of staff. I've um, worked here for 34 years. I do like working here very much and it's a very satisfying job knowing that you're saving lives. Blood is made up of four core components, plasma, platelets, white cells and red cells, each with a different crucial function. The bank acts as a giant blood factory, processing the donations into its distinct parts. When a donor um, donates blood, what they might not realize is that by splitting the blood up into its various constituents, just one blood donation could save several lives. First, each individual donation, about a pint's worth of blood, is hung in a giant overhead filtration device. This removes white cells, which can't be used in blood transfusions. So you can tell that the draining is complete because you have a pink side of the filter and a, and a darker side. So that's uh, removed almost all of the white cells. Then a high-speed centrifuge separates the plasma and the red cells. Ready to spin. You could say it speeds up the effect of gravity. It uh, allows the, the red cells, which are the heavier cells, to settle at the bottom, leaving the plasma at the top. Next, a blood press separates the red cells and plasma from the platelets. So here we have our three finished products. We have um, a plasma pack. This is our finished red cell product. And this is our finished platelet concentrate. Red cells, which carry oxygen, are critical in surgery for patients who lose a lot of blood. Platelets, which help the blood to clot, are commonly used in cancer patients. And plasma carries the other components of blood through the body. In just over a day, the blood products produced here can help save almost 5,000 lives. 20 years ago, Phil discovered firsthand how crucial these blood donations are. I am a long-term leukemia survivor. It was successfully treated. I had numerous um, blood transfusions and numerous platelet transfusions. And of course, this organization that I work for was uh, the primary provider of uh, all of those treatments. I can honestly say that um, blood transfusions saved my life, yes, definitely. By late morning, operations are underway in all of Addenbrooke's main theatres, including Theatre 20, 
where Jim and Tony are dealing with a tear in Jamie's duodenum. It's there, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It needs to be fixed, or toxic digestive enzymes could leak into Jamie's body. It's absolutely critical to recognise potential injury to, to the bowel and address it in a, in a safe way surgically. It's a challenge, isn't it? What do you think, Tony? It's a bit tricky, eh? Last time to have a look at that. I'm going to give Mr Harper a call and just ask him to come in there, put his head in and have a look at the duodenum for us. As one of the largest hospitals in the country, Addenbrooke's has hundreds of surgeons on site meaning Jim and Tony can call in specialist help. Oh, Simon, hi. Oh, hi. Be grateful just for your opinion, really. Simon Harper is an expert in repairing damaged bowel tissue. Any particular areas you're worried about? There's just one particular area. Yeah. Is it there? It's just there. Yeah, just a the small swab, please. Yeah, that was just, just there. It's just there. Yeah. Yeah, I think just some... Do you want me to do that now? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, yeah. Just yeah, have three great. PDS, please. Uh, long single. Thank you. Thank you. Simon sutures the wall of the duodenum to strengthen it. In an ideal world, we'd like to be able to do everything ourselves, but when you've got the expertise around you that can do it better than you, then it's a no-brainer. To be honest, I think that's... Should look OK. Looks OK, I think. Yeah. I don't think we need to do much more. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, okay. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. With the duodenum repaired, Jim and Tony can finish mobilising the bowel. I'm packing this bowel away. Pack the bowel away. Good. Wrapping it in wet swabs to protect it. The bowels can stay outside the body like this for the entire operation. So we've got good exposure now, Tony. I think we're pretty good. Yeah, we're pretty good. Finally, one hour after their first incision, Jim and Tony have exposed the mass they need to remove. Now they face the most dangerous part of the operation, freeing the vena cava from the surrounding tissue so they can cut off the mass. So we're going to mobilise uh, the cava, roll the cava towards me and get behind that to get all the tissue out from underneath it, and then I think we'll start to tackle the main mass. The four centimetre wide lymph node mass is attached to Jamie's vena cava and next to the aorta, the largest artery. Damaging either could cause a fatal bleed. To get control of the blood supply, Jim and Tony must tie off and divide the lumbar veins that drain blood into the vena cava. Then they must free the vena cava itself from the surrounding tissue without tearing it, before clamping it on either side of the mass so that the blood flow is cut off. Only then can they try to remove the mass without the risk of a massive bleed. Right angle to me and then my code is to Tony, please. Mobilising the vena cava is one of the most stressful parts of the operation. The wall of the vena cava is very Good. thin and it's prone to tearing and it requires real focus. Do you want to get any bleeding down there, do we, Tony? We don't really, do we? Jim and Tony must work their way around the back of the vena cava to free it from the surrounding tissue. Good. They need to be extremely delicate. Five litres of blood, the body's entire volume, flows through the vein every minute. But its walls are just a millimetre thick. The vena cava should be treated with utmost respect. If we do make a hole and there is bleeding from the vena cava, um, that bleeding can be torrential and potentially life-threatening. <laughs> you feeling brave? Well, Bravish. Yeah, just come along there, Jim, and then I might better come from below to get around that lumbar. Extending off the back of the vena cava are numerous lumbar veins, which drain blood from the lower back. The lumbar veins that can be difficult to identify, they are typically numerous, and they can cause big problems. It's stressful, the lumbars, isn't it? They can bleed a lot. So we can lift up there, roll the cava towards you. Jim and Tony need to find the veins before dividing them and carefully tying them off. Another lumber there. So there's a couple of lumbers in here. Yeah. There's another one in there. Are you serious? Yeah. It's not just the lumber veins that pose a threat. Jim and Tony 
are operating millimeters away from the aorta, the body's main artery. It's a question whether we find a little gap between cava and uh, aorta, just below the mass there. In Jamie's case, we do need to go really quite low down the vena cava. Uh, and just here, the, the vein passes behind the, the aorta. And so this is quite complex uh, surgery at this level. Like the vena cava, the aorta carries five liters of blood a minute. But any tear would be even more deadly. You don't want to go into the cava. Or, or, or the aorta. <laughs> Damage to the aorta is extremely frightening because it has a far higher pressure, so bleeding from the aorta can be very difficult to control. I just want to just do that. Mm, maybe. <laughs> it's really important to remain calm and collected. If there's any degree of panic or, or Ill irrational thinking, uh, the, the situation can get out of control. That's a bit close to aorta, I think. Yeah, it's a bit close to aorta, Tony. I don't know. It's at the forefront of your your mind um, in every single operation that you could get a sudden, you know, very serious life-threatening bleed. Mm. Okay, let's reassess. Let's reassess. In Theatre 22, Ricky and Samir are facing a major bleed. Their operation to remove the tumour in Sam's neck has grown to a halt as they try to stem the blood flow. Wash, please. If it doesn't stop, Sam could bleed to death. You have to control the bleeding as quickly as you can, but safely. Slowly, 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 slowly. There's a certain amount I will let happen by my assistant, my trainee, my fellow, whoever, and I'll be the assistant. Get this out of the way on that side like that. There are certain times in the operation that has to just change. Close seal. With the vessel still bleeding. Let's switch this around. I need to drive now. Ricky takes control. I need to now take charge here because if there is a small hole in the artery, I need to know how I'm going to sort that out. It's not the reflection of a uh, lack of trust in that person or a concern about their ability. It's, I can't leave that to Samir because he's never had to face that in his life. Magda, what's the blood pressure? 140. 140? Yeah. In stressful situations in theatre when things go wrong, having Ricky around um, is, is very reassuring. What's his resting or baseline? Yeah, 141. That's his baseline when he came. I have been involved in surgeries where we've lost a substantial number of litres of blood, and it almost looks like, you know, we, we will lose a patient. Uh, and that's very scary. Big sucker on. Quick, quick, quick. A lot of bleeding here. If we can't control the bleeding at all, well, that's it. You know, you'll die. There is a lot of things that could go wrong, which is very scary. But I know that the surgeon knows what he's doing, so I'm just hope he'll be fine after the surgery and I get my sound back. Gradually, Ricky begins to stem the blood flow. Right, do we have two suckers working yet? Right, let's have a stack of squares of surgery cell. Low seal. Yep. Finally, he is able to cauterize the vessel. Okay, stop. After an hour, the bleeding is under control. Right, how much have we lost? 1,750 mil. Sam has lost over one third of the blood in his entire body. Any more, and he would have needed a life saving blood transfusion. When that bleeding finally stops, you know, it is a moment of relief. Right, let's have a wet mastoid. Now we can actually get on and do the operation. Now, almost six hours into the operation, they begin the riskiest part, removing the three centimetre tumour growing within the spinal canal. Manipulating tumours away from the spinal cord, 
can irritate the spinal cord, and that's always a risk of paralysis. They start by dissecting the outer part of the tumor, cutting it with a scalpel. Cut that bit off. Cut that bit off. Before using a bipolar machine, which burns the tissue away with an electrical current. Bit by bit. It's delicate work. The operating field is smaller than a tenpence piece. Focus, focus, focus. As they dissect the tumor away, they can see that it's growing from within the dura, the protective membrane surrounding the spinal cord. Proving to be a bit more of a bugger than uh, I was hoping. To remove the rest of the tumor, they need to open the dura. Get ready to open the dura. So it's going to be over here somewhere. So open it from this side. When you open the dura, there's nothing protecting the, the spinal cord. Okay, let's do it. Let's have a look down there. The dura is less than half a millimeter thick. Are you through? I don't think you're through. Hook, please. Cut too deep, and they risk severing the spinal cord, which would permanently paralyze some. Angle in the, yeah. Come on, go through, go through. There you go. Right, the bake is to me. With the dura open, the rest of the tumor is finally exposed. This is neurofibroma, it's involving all the C2 nerve roots. The remaining part is only a few millimeters long, but it's crucial that Ricky removes it. If this is a cancerous thing, then there's a need to remove all of it. And nerve sacrifice has to be an accepted consequence of that. So this, in fact, is coming from the sensory nerve rootlets. We'll cut the whole thing off. The only way to take it all out is to cut off the nerve root. Scissors. Sam will lose some sensation, but only in a small area at the back of his head and neck. We don't often amputate the nerve root. We don't. But this nerve root doesn't contribute to any of the uh, arm function, finger function, dexterity, walking, anything. So it's one that we can sacrifice. As Ricky gets ready to cut away the remaining part of the tumor, he must push it through the dura, away from the spinal cord. As much of the surgery you can do away from the spinal cord, the safer it is. Push it away, and then cut it. Well, that's a... Uh... Huge moment for us. Hooray! After almost eight hours in theatre, the last section of tumour is finally out. It's very satisfying when you get to the end of the operation and the tumour's gone, especially if you've had, you know, hiccups. OK, let's uh, close this up. Oh, flipping heck. I would love to say this will be San's last operation. However, he will come to more surgery at some point in time. Okay, on three, one, two, three. When I'm gone, one of my protégés will take this on and that expertise and that skill set to look after him. It's a privilege, I think, to be working with Ricky, to be part of a very small group of people who will have obtained these skills. You're just waking up, Sam. It's all gone very well. Maybe in years to come, I'll be looking after Sam and potentially even his family. Sam will spend the next two days recovering in hospital before he can return home to his wife and children. Theatre 20, Jim and Tony are operating to remove Jamie's lymph node mass. 
but they're struggling to free the lower part of the Vena Cava, where it sits next to the aorta. We were right on the cava there, aren't we? The aorta wall is just there. They need to have full control of the vein so they can clamp it and remove the mass without causing a fatal bleed. So we can lift up there, yeah. roll the cava towards you. Jim and Tony must find a safe place to cut between the cava and the surrounding tissue. I mean, can you just develop that little plane yeah. there? Let's get into that gap. Your reliant on your colleague gently retracting the cava. Tricky. Yeah. We're almost around. They have to be incredibly careful. Very nearly. And that's, that's where we work very well as a team, I think. Good. That's it, well done. Are you round? I am. Great. Okay, good. So we've got cava very, very free now, haven't we? Finally, the vena cava is free. Once we've got full control, we uh, feel a, a sense of relief. That's great. Well done, Tony. All of the work that we've done so far has led us to this moment. Now they'll be able to clamp the section of the vena cava where the mass is attached to prevent a major bleed. But it's now clear that the mass is almost completely fused to the vein. Densely adherent, the mass, the main mass, the vena cava. Actually pretty stuck, isn't it? It is. If they try to remove the mass, they could cause a tear in the cava that would need a complex repair. That will mean a graft, and that can have implications in the long term. We could ask John to have a quick look and give us a hand with this. We could, couldn't we, really? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. John Boyle. John Boyle. Can we bring the vascular surgeon? Tony and Jim are urological, not vascular surgeons. So they call in a specialist, an expert in handling and repairing blood vessels. There's no harm in asking for help, and indeed it should be encouraged. I've never had a problem with asking for help. I don't feel a lesser person for doing so. Which side do you want me, guys? This side? Which side do you want, John? John Boyle is one of the country's leading vascular surgeons. One of the nice things about my specialty is we do go and help other surgeons in virtually all other specialties at various points in time with problems with big blood vessels. The only surgeons who don't have complications are either not operating or, or they're lying to you, because we all have complications. Right. Sure, what we've got. So completely mobile caver. Yeah. Complete control there of every yeah. lumbar up to, well, every lumbar, basically. Are you trying to lift it off yet? Well, we have the bit, yeah. And it's pretty stuck. OK. So do you want to chip some of it off yeah, for you? Yeah. Please, yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> Having John in theatre does give me a great deal of confidence. Should there be any issues and any need to reconstruct or repair the vena cava, he's right there to, to do that. What stitches do you want, John, just in case? <laughs> Gradually, John begins to cut the lymph node mass from the thin wall of the vena cava. The thing about these things is I, I don't want to leave anything behind. No. Yeah, exactly. That's good work. Got it. That's good, eh? That's good, eh? Well, just wait two minutes, clamp it, and you guys take it off yeah. and we'll see what's left, shall we? Yeah. John's prized the edges of the mass away from the vena cava without damaging it. Have we got vascular clamps ready? Yeah. 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 OK, OK. Really now they clamp off the blood supply to the vena cava in case it gets damaged as they completely free the mass. We're cross -clamp clamping the cava now, Yilva. OK. Right then, should we take this off, Tony? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Jim takes over to make the final incision to remove the mass. I'm just going to start taking off here, I think. Yeah, I mean, you can... You made the suction ready, Hanny. Hopefully it's not going to bleed. Good, Jim. Really nice. There we go. Oh, that's brilliant. The cable, lymph node mass. It's very gratifying. We know that then the operation is largely finished. So a couple of large, uh, large Langenbecks, please. It, it can't be underestimated the, the value of operating with people that you know and trust. And having a team that supports one another is, is critical when under undertaking major complex surgery such as this. Well done, Tony. I think we're pretty much done. Hello? Well done, John. Well done. 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 Well
on Jamie. Nice deep breaths. Jamie will recover in hospital for the next few days. Hello, it's Jim Armitage here. Hi, Jim, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, just calling to let you know that Jamie's operation is all done. Thank goodness. Uh, it all went really well. Excellent, well, thank you so much for all you've done. It's, uh... Yeah, he's relief. <laughs> Even though the operation has gone well, the lymph nodes removed still need to be analyzed to see if they contain active cancer. If they do, Jamie could face another round of painful chemotherapy. Six weeks after the operation to remove two tumors on Sam's nerves, further tests revealed that they were atypical meaning they weren't completely benign. The surgeon told me that had I not had the lump removed, the potential for them to turn cancerous or you know, cause paralysis was high. I'm unbelievably grateful to the surgeons and the whole team, to be honest. If they didn't do it, then, you know, my husband might not be here. But Sam and his family will have to live with this condition for the rest of their lives. It's not the end of the road for us. My two boys have got it as well. We're just gonna have to be a strong family as much as we can. It's very important for me to be a role model, that they see that I'm strong and that you, know, you can live a normal life with it. It's now five weeks since Jamie had the operation to remove a lymph node mass from his vena cava. A week or two after his operation, we got the, the excellent news that the, the lymph nodes they removed were, were benign. Well, good start. Yeah. Knowing that I'm cancer free is just amazing. My dad has been there every step of the way, very supportive. A lot of confidence now. He just makes you smile. I did promise him at the outset of all of this, when, when he first discovered the lump, that I would be there for him. And that's what I've done. Oh, there we are. Oh, and he and it didn't come in. Well, congratulations. Well played. <laughs> it is sad that I've lost the nine months, but going forward, it's, it's going to be good. I can feel it. Over their time in Addenbrooke's, Jamie and Sam were looked after by around 50 medical specialists, including seven surgeons. In this day and age, we do work well as teams. I think in the old days, this didn't happen. Individual surgeons operated very individually, but things are very different nowadays. This is like our family, you know, uh, I'm part of the fabric, they're part of my fabric. So I am always very, very grateful uh, when we uh, are able to call upon our experienced staff to be involved in these sorts of cases because it makes it a bit easier to deal with. Next time. I'm happy that he's having the operation, but I hate what is going to be done to him. You do eight, eight corkscrews in the head. Life-changing surgery. It is nerve-wracking. Pushing the boundaries of the human body. So there's no margin for error here. Where the stakes are high. The one complication that is always in the back of our mind is paralysis. <laughs>